Once again, live from the parking lot of Sprouts Farmer's Market, it is the daily Sacramento Parking Lot with Lawn Show. Let's see what should be the theme song. Dee, 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 dee. Anyway, I just barely made it. The car made it. Uh, it is not unbearably hot today. Uh, not yet, anyway. And uh, so I'm glad we made it just right on time. Uh, yesterday we were uh, we went through the tarot of ceremonial magic uh, uh, in uh, tandem with uh, the 22 and 20 secret instructions of the master from uh, uh, Crowley's Heart of the Master. And we started off by uh, uh, showing the image of the Scottish Rite double-headed eagle symbol for the 32nd uh, and 30 degree, 33rd degrees of uh, uh, Freemasonry. Uh, and read Crowley's uh, chapter 33, Baphomet, of the Book of Lies. And uh, when uh, Christopher Hyatt and uh, I and David Wilson, or uh, S. Jason Black, uh, conspired to, uh, to write a book that we called Alistair Crowley's Illustrated Goetia, uh, Christopher Hyatt and uh, I conspired on the text, and David uh, drew the illustrations. He, David, drew uh, a nice color image of my version of uh, the Devil card from Tarot of Ceremonial Magic, and we used we used it as the cover. And uh, so I I drug this out to share this with you this morning. And then it occurred to me that there's some pretty good shit in, uh, I mean, there's very good information in this uh, uh, book. It's a, I believe it was the fourth book that uh, Christopher Hyatt and I uh, did together very, very early in the 90s. And I want to, so let's talk, of, here, let me do this. Let's talk about Goetia a little bit, and I'm going to just read a couple of little clips here. But because today is uh, uh, the falls within the third decan of uh, of Gemini, we're in the what twenty something degree of. Uh, uh, or no, we're in the uh, yeah, we're in the twenty something degree of uh, Gemini this morning, if I'm not uh, mistaken. And there's a day spirit and a night spirit, or a day demon and a night demon, uh, associated with this period in the zodiac. And that same uh, decan uh, is also a tarot card, one of the small cards, the dreaded. Ten of Swords, which you're seldom happy to see pop up in a reading. But there's two spirits that uh, uh, go with uh, with this, and the day spirit associated uh, with this time period is a huge one, Payamon. And there is uh, S. Jason Black, or David Wilson's... Uh, rendering of it. I love his camel. <laughs> now, some of these may look a little whimsical and everything else, but I assure you, of all the people I've ever met in my entire life, uh, David Wilson had, uh, uh, before his untimely demise, uh, had evoked pretty, pretty much every one of these. And he did a, a very special evocation very early on in our friendship and very early on in his career whereby he made a particular 
in my opinion, even at the time, an unwise pact with Payamon. Uh, but, uh, you know, that might be another story. But here's what it says about Payamon, and this will be the hors d'oeuvre to our talk today. If the truck unloading will allow me. The ninth spirit in this order is Payamon, a great king and very obedient unto Lucifer. He appears in the form of a man sitting on a dromedary with a most glorious crown upon his head. Before him march an host of spirits, like men with trumpets and cymbals and all other sorts of musical instruments. He has a great voice and roars at his first coming, and his speech is such that the magician will not be able to understand him unless compelled. He can teach all arts and sciences and other secret things. He can reveal to you what the earth is, and what holds it up in the waters, and what mind is, and where it is or any other thing you may desire to know. He gives dignity and confirms the same. He binds or makes any man subject to the magician, if he so desire it. He gives good familiars who can teach all arts. He is to be observed toward the West. He is of the order of dominations or dominions. He has under him 200 legions of spirits, and part of them are of the order of angels, and the other part of potentates. Now if you call this spirit Payamon alone, you must make him some offering. And there will attend him two kings called Labal and Abalim and also other spirits who were of the order of potentates in his host, and twenty-five legions. And those spirits who are subject unto them are not always with them unless the magician compels them. And this is his seal. And one thing I like about uh, uh, what we've done with this book is we've, we've actually used the first drawings that we could find from the Le Megaton of the seals. So they're not all neat and clean and polished and put in circles with their names on it. This is what the seals from the original text actually look like. Just not in circles, not in just out there like that. Okay, pretty dramatic stuff, huh? This is how I started out with chapter three, the danger of high magic. I started off with uh, an epigram from Aleister Crowley. The single supreme ritual is the attainment of the knowledge and conversation of the holy guardian angel. It is the raising of the complete man in a vertical straight line. Any deviation from this line tends to be black magic. Any other operation is black magic. If the magician needs to perform any other operation than this, referring to the knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel, it is only lawful in so far as it is a necessary preliminary to that one work. And that's from Theory and Practice. It is no secret that to many modern students of esoterica, Goetia has a decidedly shady reputation. On a scale of spiritual practices, one might find Goetia sandwiched somewhere between packs with the devil and addiction to the Ouija board. This attitude is understandable. After all, Goetia is the intentional conjuration of spiritual beings who are by definition, fallen angels, 
evil spirits and demons. From their infernal abodes, these naughty spirits are called forth to act as personal servants to the Goetic magician, to extend his power and execute his will on earth. A magician must be ever vigilant to the wiles of the spirit, to be killed or loses control even for an instant. He runs the risk of being obsessed, possessed, or even destroyed. This sounds uncomfortably like black magic. Such behavior is certainly beneath the altruistic purity of purpose that characterize the, the quest and disciplines of high magic and can only serve to bring out the lowest qualities of the practitioner's character. Or so the argument goes against Goetic evocation. And so far as it goes, it's a point well taken. Yes, the spirits in question are of an infernal variety. But what exactly does that mean? If we embrace for a moment the popular nomenclature of high magic, infernal relates to the subconscious stratum of the human psyche. Spirits inhabiting these regions would then be the personifications of powers or energies that lie buried in our subconscious minds qualities of our consciousness we've disowned. They are fallen because they have slipped from the conscious control of the deity, ourselves. Yes, they are dangerous, because while they remain unmastered, they can surface unbidden and wreak all the havoc modern psychology blames on things hidden in the subconscious mind. To the charge that such practices bring out the worst qualities in the magician's character, the goetic practitioner pleads guilty, pointing out that this is precisely the purpose of this variety of evocation. If these disowned spirits are not brought forth, identified, and controlled, the magician, like the rest of humanity, is doomed to be at the mercy and caprice of his own subconscious demons, never being allowed the opportunity to subdue these denizens of his psychic menagerie. But are the spirits of the Goetia simply subjective components of the magician's mind? Or is there really an independent objective quality to their natures? This fundamental question may never receive a satisfactory answer, due to the fact that no one really understands the nature of matter. But one thing is certain. One who has never experienced a goetic evocation is not qualified to voice even the most educated opinion on the subject. It's one thing to be well read on a subject, it's quite another to be part of the subject itself. It's an unfortunate fact that there are many individuals who make magic their life without making their lives magic. Even the most talented and brilliant expounders of the art sometimes lose sight of this and focus instead on historical or technical aspects of the subject to such a degree that they ignore completely its relevance to their daily life and happiness. Then I go on to describe uh, my first comedy of errors of an evocation, but I'm going to s skip ahead to the opening of chapter five uh, to actually put this kind of in historic perspective. Chapter 5, History. And my epigram is actually from the Talmud, uh, uh, Berakot, however that's pronounced, Berakot, number 6. 
If the eye could see the demons that people the universe, existence would be impossible. That's from the Talmud. The format of Goetic evocation contains perhaps the most colorful and recognizable elements of any type of Western ceremonial magic. The magician, robed and armed, stands inside the magic circle, protected from the malice of the spirits by innumerable holy names scrawled thereupon. Several feet away stands the spirit, trapped inside the triangle of art. With his wand upraised, the magician issues his commands and the spirit reluctantly obeys. This is the stuff of sword and sorcerer movies. Yet, it is precisely the method, and it's come down to us in a most extraordinary way. 16th and 17th century Europe abounded with a myriad of practitioners of the magical arts who, for the most part, were inspired by the colorful images of Middle Eastern magic. We must keep in mind that for many years much of the Iberian Peninsula was occupied by the Muslims. Ironically, even though Islamic law dictates scripts, uh, strict proscriptions against unorthodox spiritual practices, the occupation forces tolerated a handful of Spanish communities where a certain level of spiritual freedom flourished. These pockets of liberality attracted not only the innovative practitioners of the black arts, but also the Jewish Kabbalists, whose wisdom was, for the first time, committed to writing. This period was to profoundly influence the Renaissance, and subsequently the entire hermetic tradition of Western civilization. It's from this tradition the concept of Solomonic magic was developed. Spirits or genie trapped in bottles, magic carpets, great treasures protected by demons, all reminiscent of a thousand and one Arabian nights. The text that has come, become known as the Goetia is the first book of what is commonly referred to as the Lamegaton, a collection of five texts traditionally attributed to King Solomon. The most popular versions, including the one Crowley hired McGrether Mathers to translate, was drawn primarily from translations of Sloan Manuscript Numbers 2731 and 3648 in the possession of the British Library. Few individuals today are so naive as to believe that the author was indeed the legendary King Solomon. Indeed, there is no evidence to demonstrate that the five texts are even the work of a single author, or that the authors were even practicing magicians. In fact, by the very nature of the translations, it's obvious that the scribe or scribes were decidedly hostile toward the art. Many of the spirits are clearly the gods and goddesses of older religions who were banished to the infernal regions by the new order. Many of the dukes, especially, uh, yes, many of the dukes especially seem to have been originally female in character. A most dangerous spiritual idea to lonely monastic scribes prone to fantasies. And I'm not just trying to be flippant and vulgar. That's who actually put pen to paper when copying these, these books, okay? Magic books attributed to King Solomon circulated throughout Europe since at least the middle of the 16th century. 
Sloan 2731 dates from 1687 and most likely is the result of one practitioner's desire to have his favorite Solomonic works bound conveniently into one volume. It also appears that he used the opportunity to update the texts by revising the language and using the vernacular of the day. As archaic as the language appears to us today, the Lamegaton, that's those five books, including the Goetia, the Lamegaton represents a new, improved 17th century version of far older material. And how old, we really can't say. The magical revival of the late 1800s resulted in new translations and the Lamegaton and the Goetia emerged from near complete obscurity into the light of relative obscurity. And students and practitioners of the occult have been tantalized by its mysteries ever since. Modern editions of the Goetia remain in print and continue to sell very well. Almost every student of magic worth his or her salt has at least one copy. Yet relatively few individuals actually have participated in a Goetian evocation. The reasons are many, but perhaps the single most compelling excuse is rooted in the mistaken belief that in order to succeed in evocation, one must conform exactly with the procedures and conjurations outlined in the text. The seemingly endless pages of tedious, archaic, and parochial conjurations, constraints, exorcisms, and curses continue to bewilder and, and discourage 99% of would-be Goetic magicians. And that's exactly what they're intended to do. The universe was very simple from the traditional Goetic magician's point of view. Above him was God, the creator of the world and the ultimate source of his authority. Below the magician was an infernal world inhabited by demons and demon spirits who were once angels of the Lord, but now exiled from heaven as punishment for their pride and disobedience. Their fall established the interdependent threefold world in which we find ourselves. Heaven, Earth, Hell. Oh boy. You just say hell and a dragon truck appears roaring ever. Okay. Like the titans of Greek mythology, infernal spirits, not God, are responsible for the maintenance of the material world, including the earthly, fleshly nature of man. As a resident of earth, the magician stands between the divine and the infernal worlds. If he is pious before the eyes of his God, then he has the divine authority to order and control the lower spirits. To achieve this authoritative state of mind, the magicians of old recited lengthy litanies of affirmations and self-aggrandizements itemizing their high morals and examples of their religious piety. You obeyed Moses, you obeyed Aaron, and by God you'll obey me. Two. Once he had convinced himself that he had the authority to command the spirit, the magician next had to achieve the subjective state of mind whereby he could actually see it. This he induced by use of magic words, which he recited 
much like a mantra. In this way, he created a strange and mystic atmosphere in which nothing was impossible and anything could happen. Standing in the circle, protected by the divine names with which he had aligned himself, the magician, pumped up by affirmations and intoxicated by magic words, concentrated upon the triangle until the spirit appeared. I love the sound effects this morning. The, the universally holy virtues of all things triune was enough to trap the spirit in the triangle long enough to receive the charge from the magician. After receiving his orders, the spirit was given license to depart to go forth and do the magician's bidding. The text of Goetia is filled with the details of such operations, page after page of conjurations, constraints, invocation, curses, greater curses, and addresses to the spirit on his arrival and departure, etc. In practice, there exist today Goetia magicians, both solitary practitioners and organized groups, who operate strictly by the book. The circle, the triangle, and all the diagrams are constructed exactly as illustrated in the Goetia. They recite, or, or most often read, the conjurations, constraints, and curses exactly as written in the 1687 texts. The th ceremonies of some of these magicians are a thrill to behold. And without a doubt, the art, the art form will forever be perpetuated in its classic form because of their dedicated labor. And if I may digress for a moment, the work of the great modern magician, Carol Polk Runyon, is one of these magicians that I'm referring to that, that replicate in awesome uh, detail and pageantry uh, Goetic magic by the, by the book. And indeed, uh, it is an awesome thrill uh, to behold. And uh, hopefully you can find his uh, uh, his books and some and his videos. Uh, there's a, a video on Solomonic magic uh, where you can see Pope in action or Pope's group in action. Uh, I strongly recommend that that uh, you uh, you become familiar with it because it truly is awesome. It must be pointed out, however, that there is absolutely no necessity nor particular advantage to blindly conforming with the conjuration scripts of the ancient texts. The spirits are no more impressed if you say thee and thine than they are if you say you and yours. Aleister Crowley was aware of this and crafted several versions of his own conjurations. In fact, as we'll see later, in his own copy of the Goetia, he simply hand copied the second key or the second call of the Enochian system. It's our opinion, and that of other Crowley scholars, that for personal Goetic conjurations, Crowley most likely in his later years discarded the traditional conjurations and simply recited the first and second Enochian calls. I have to digress and say this is after years of doing it the traditional way. And I confess that when I operate uh, Goeshiki vocations, I do it in my own way. Uh, but only after 
years and years and years of doing it the traditional way. So I'm not saying discard the, the uh, uh, traditional way of doing it. I'm saying be intimately familiar so that you understand exactly what it is that you are doing when you're doing it the traditional way. Then you'll understand where the magic lies in the procedure and you can fashion procedures of your own. It's also our opinion that the most effective conjurations are of the magician's own design. We encourage the reader once the fundamentals of the system are thoroughly grasped to create your own conjuration, which, like your temple equipment and procedures, is uniquely yours. And that's where we're going to stop uh, today with our little uh, talk on the Goetia. If you have uh, a Goetia, uh, I think it was actually the text was also published early on uh, by Arthur Edward Waite uh, under the title, The Book of Black Magic and Pax. But uh, uh, Weiser uh, publishes uh, a, a wonderful, wonderful uh, edition in paper, paperback, simply called uh, uh, Goetia. It has fabulous notes fabulous uh, uh, appendices with uh, wonderful charts and things like that. And if you were, if you don't have a Goetia and are going to go shopping for one, that's the one I would recommend that you become familiar with first. That's the one that uh, back in the uh, mid-70s, uh, Helen Parsons Smith sent me a uh, a facsimile edition that uh, Jimmy Page had uh, uh, paid to have uh, uh, reproduced, and it, the the book appeared on my <laughs> on my doorstep one one morning with the Helen Parsons Smith uh, uh, note in it, uh, billing me for it. <laughs> I yeah I wished I would have ordered it I should have ordered it but she uh, she jumped uh, she said you need this so here's this uh, and here's the bill <laughs> anyway until tomorrow continue to be good to yourself and be good to each other do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law love is the law love under will. <laughs>